Happy Independence Day weekend. I hope you had a happy fourth yesterday. I will bet that it um, was the most uh, unique Fourth of July celebration that most of you have had in your life. But uh, knowing Silverside folks, I'm pretty sure some of you, several of you, found uh, interesting ways uh, to make it a special holiday nonetheless, if uh, indeed it is one of the holidays that you uh, that you celebrate. Uh, so uh, today, I'd like to have you think with me for several minutes <clears throat> on this topic. Patriotism in a new key. And let's start today's conversation for inspiration with a story about the Northern Baptists who came into being in 1845 as a result of a split with Baptists in the South. Prior to that, there was just one Baptist group in the United States. Some of you would say that was plenty. One Baptist group was plenty. Some of you would say that was one too many. Uh, sorry that some of you have such prejudice against Baptists, but I understand that with those who have been in the forefront for the last 25 years here in the United States, such jerks uh, uh, and the tendency to sort of group them all together uh, that uh, that you would end up thinking that but not all Baptists are or have been bad people I'm a Baptist and there are several people at Silverside Saints and the foundational stones who consider themselves also Baptist. Nonetheless, back to my story, 1845, the Baptists from the one group there was in the United States were having their every three-year meeting, which they called the Triennial Convention. And they were meeting that year in the South at First Baptist Church of Augusta, Georgia. The Baptists in the North, the Baptists from the North, had the audacity to tell the Baptists from the South that they could no longer support the idea of slavery in general, but very specifically, they could no longer endorse the idea of sending missionaries from the one Baptist group there was in the United States and paying them out of Baptist funds to go to Africa to attempt to evangelize the brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and children of those Africans who were slaves and working their plantations in the South. Just so you know, the Baptists weren't the only culprits. Most Baptists in the South uh, were joined by other, as far as I know, all other Christian denominations in having some sort of split over slavery. The exception was probably the Quakers. As a scripture reference today, I have a passage from uh, a collected teaching from Jesus, attributed to Jesus, that has absolutely nothing in the world to do with patriotism. As a matter of fact, nothing Jesus taught has anything to do with patriotism. Now, the closest uh, anybody can come is uh, uh, you know, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's and unto God what is God's. That had nothing to do with patriotism. That had to do with surviving the best you could if you were uh, subservient to a, a superpower, which was the Roman Empire. Nothing to do at all with, uh, with patriotism uh, in, a, in a democracy or in any other kind of thing I can think about, except in 
the same kind of situation that Jesus found himself in. And let me just toss in here the experience that you have of being in a democracy and having the opportunity to be patriotic or not was a choice Jesus never had. He was never in his lifetime politically a free person. All right, to this saying that is in a context of Jesus trying to teach his disciples how to handle things when he sends them out to do ministry on their own and he's not with them, and they're saying, oh boy, people are not going to like what we say, and uh, some people are going to try to rough us up, some people are going to say ugly things to us, you know, it's going to be rough out there, and we're used to having you with us to sort of help us figure things out, and so forth, and so on. As a part of that, there's this little snippet, and there's a lot of danger in taking little snippets, but I'm taking a snippet today nonetheless. Be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. I'm laying that as a groundwork or a foundation for rewriting the song of patriotism, even though I've told you it had nothing to do with patriotism in the way that Jesus finally used it. These words get uh, translated in a number of ways. The word that the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible translates wise can also be translated very appropriately as shrewd, as you see in the picture of the poster that I've included at the bottom of the screen. And the word translated as innocent in reference to doves can also be translated as uh, harmless or gentle. But you get the picture. Uh, you can't be gullible. Uh, you can't just walk around um, uh, in la-la land uh, thinking that everything will fall into place for you and others, uh, even though you are a person of faith and even though you're trying to live according to the standards of Jesus. You have to be smart in a world that uh, has people in it who will try to take advantage of you, some especially because you are a person of faith. They think you're soft and gullible. So let's uh, say that being patriotic in these days as modern Americans requires both shrewdness as well as a determination um, not to cause harm. Patriotism in a new key. I totally admire, and I play the piano decently. No, nowhere in the league of Melissa or John Siegfried. I mean, nowhere in the league. But I, I, I'm okay, and if I practiced, I would be a little better than okay. I, once upon a time, was good enough to play for rehearsals sometimes at men's chorus at Carson Newton College with a lot of music majors present. So I, I, I was okay, but that was more than four or five years ago. Anyway, anyway, uh, I could not transpose, that is go up a half a key or up a key, if my life depended on it literally. And there were all these music majors at Carson Newman, especially the organ majors, it seemed, who could just do that. They're playing along, and one of the organ professors would say, transpose. Uh, now, not, not, with a, not with a Bach piece or something like that, but with a hymn, let's say. And they could just do it. Uh, they had two or three music theory courses and maybe a composition course, which I never had. But they could just do it. Reminds me of one of my dear, dear church members now, now playing the organ for the heavenly choirs, a dermatologist by trade in um, New Orleans, Dr. John Marion Yarbrough. Dear, dear, dear friend, wonderful person, uh, somebody beloved by my whole family. John, John's avocation was being an organist. He could have been an organist by vocation. And one of the things he liked to do at this time of year, and the regular organist would often be away on the 4th of July weekend, John would often fill in, 
Um, and we would often sing uh, as a part of the uh, patriotic hymn collection, uh, God of our fathers, whose almighty hand. Uh, if you're familiar with the patriotic hymns and Protestant hymnals, uh, it, it has the trumpet sound coming up. Dum, da 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 dun 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 God of our fathers. Okay, you got it, or you don't. But anyway, it has about five or six stanzas, and John would really show off that Sunday because he would transpose every stanza up a half step. Wow. Well, John, I'll bet you're listening right now and laughing that I'm telling that story about you. I could have told much worse stories about you, as I'm sure you know, and you could have done the same in reference to me. So we will honor each other's distance for the moment. I love John Yarborough. Any case, in any case, transposition was required. And so as we come up with a song of patriotism in a new key, transposition will be required. Because what many people have thought patriotism is for a very long time isn't. It isn't. Patriotism, as a matter of fact, is multifaceted, and different people experience the facets of it at different levels, at different times in their lives, depending on their experience. So we're going to take all the words that we deal with uh, in our developing lyrics and uh, put them all together. And they will reflect what we are at our best. Uh, they will reflect uh, what some of the best of us are all the time. People are uh, appropriately uh, patriotic already. There's, there, there are a few. There are a few. Um, our lyrics will reflect traits uh, all of us need to be good citizens of the world and to be a nation that survives. There is no guarantee that we will survive unless we work at it. Well, even then there's no guarantee, but there's a much greater likelihood that we can survive if we get ourselves together, cooperate, take care of each other, all of us, and, and struggle to survive, there's a chance that we can. The word is patriotism. Each letter will give us an adjective um, that will describe a mature patriot or a developing patriot. And our song that uh, will be in a new key from the way patriotism has been sung in the past, perhaps. And the first letter, P, represents peaceful. Plenty of people laugh at uh, pastors and idealistic protesters for imagining that there could ever be a time without war, because there have been so few times without war. Uh, plenty of people take it as just something that goes with being human, living in a complicated world. As we transpose traditional patriotism into our new song of patriotism, I'm going to say that the A stands for attentive. There are plenty of things to be attentive about. Let's start with our own citizens and the health of our citizens. This, uh, as you see uh, on the screen here, is the latest uh, chart I could find about what's going on in terms of numbers of cases, numbers of recoveries, numbers of deaths of the COVID virus by nation with some key cities uh, pointed out. 
and you see what the, the figures in the cartoon are saying. Uh, the person who thinks that he is brave may actually be uh, the, the coward. We had better be attentive to what's going on outside our country that impacts our country and our safety. This latest news that uh, Russia secretly offered some militants from Afghanistan bounty money to kill U.S. troops uh, is very, very frightening. Uh, and uh, the Trump administration uh, is denying it, and it already uh, tried to get rid of people who knew about this. Um, there's a lot of derriere kissing uh, of Putin's rear by the White House. The T in my acrostic song stands for tolerance. Patriots in a, a diverse nation, a nation with a diverse citizenry, have to be tolerant. Intolerance is intolerable. Again, there are plenty of people laughing at those of us who believe that we can have unity among us despite the differences among us, ethnically, religiously, um, in terms of economic positioning and so forth. But what we're working toward in a democracy is zero discrimination. And right now we are at a place where we are not earning a very good grade at all. In fact, we are at, we are at, at an F level at most uh, places. This is a chart, even if you stop the video, I don't think you'll be able to read it, but if you're interested in it, we can send you a hard copy or a, um, an email copy from the office. But what it shows is there are five levels of achieving maturity as somebody who can accept uh, diverse opinions, ideas, races, and so forth. That is, people who are different from me, you, and so forth. Level one is basic, and you have to move all the way up to level five, which is uh, which means it's going to stick. It takes some doing; it doesn't happen overnight. Once the prejudice is embedded, and we're not born with prejudice, so that's another story. But once it's there, and it's there for a lot of people who sort of wake up and realize that they have prejudice against people, like lots of people. If you try to change it, and not, not a lot of people necessarily want to change it. If you want to change it, there are five stages you have to go through until you get to the place where you are changed. Let's take the R to mean realistic. The eagle is one of our national symbols, not the ostrich. So let's be realistic. The more guns there are, the more needless deaths there are. Period. Period. Nobody has ever been able to challenge that simple fact. People talk around it and through it, doesn't change it. And uh, in uh, the, the protests of um, police abuse of people uh, and uh, so some of the frustration related to uh, attempted quarantines and so forth, uh, gun violence is on the rise in many urban areas in this country as if we didn't have enough to worry about already.
Patriots need a place to be patriotic. We, many of us, love our land, literally the land on which we live. And yet, many of us are some of the worst offenders when it comes to abusing the land so that uh, people are dying, other people are dying. Sometimes we're killing ourselves by the things that we do. And then uh, those with whom we share the planet, say animals such as these beautiful, beautiful animals on the screen, literally have a few feet of habitat left. The front cover of the magazine that you see there at the bottom left of your screen goes all the way back to 2012. And psychologists were already at that point wondering about the psychological effects of global warming on U.S. citizens. I say, let's stop the global warming. Let's improve the environment. And um, that would be the best help to that psychological malady. We have to be realistic about how uh, all drug abuse is killing people. Uh, opioid, the opioid crisis has been sort of front and center. It's not the only one. I think progress has been made uh, because so many people care and so many people are making the effort to make the difference. But we have to be realistic about it. Till we're realistic about it and name it as a problem we can't do anything. Generally speaking, once Americans set their minds to something, particularly in groups, and if you've heard me speak much, you know that in my preaching, I tend to draw a line between individual behavior and group behavior. I think that's important. But as a group of people, once we set our minds to something, we are, at least can be, but I think most often are indefatigable. In some respects, when there's a crisis, Americans are at their best. When there's a disaster, disaster relief teams drop everything, wherever they may be, and get themselves to the place, places around the country or the world where people are in need and start doing something about it. I've long, long admired Doctors Without Borders who, who leave busy medical practices to go and, uh, and try to bring some kind of healing, usually with very limited facilities and medications, but nonetheless to bring their medical expertise to people around the world who wouldn't have any attention were they not there. Senior adults are an often overlooked group in our culture, even though there's a whole there are a whole there are whole bunches of us. <laughs> we shouldn't be overlooked. Um, here are some National Guards men coming to the aid of a senior a senior citizen. And again, back to some of the others with whom we share the planet. Animals have to be saved, need to be saved also during disasters. They get separated from their owners, sometimes permanently. They need care or they're going to die. Thank goodness there are people trying to do that too. I mentioned frequently the contributions that the health care providers have made in our making and fighting uh, this coronavirus. Uh, it is it, it's amazing. Many of you don't know that I thought in high school that I was going to become a medical doctor and uh, worked in a hospital for two years. And then I made a very important decision that you should thank me for. I decided not to. Let's let O stand for optimistic. How in the world could people going through fear about the virus and a terrible economy 
um, sometimes sick loved ones, some, uh, sometimes separation from loved ones. How could how could Americans going through that <laughs> have any hope? How could they experience any optimism in the midst of this mess? And yet there was a poll, I think, from the New York Times showing that a lot of people still remain hopeful. Americans tend to be optimistic people. New York Times, uh, just a few days ago, uh, there's a stay-at-home mom in rural Arizona. Um, hey, Elsa. Hey, Jen. Hey, Barrett. Hey, Charlie. Um, she's feeling overwhelmed. Uh, her father is diabetic. You can see here on the screen, he lost his job. Um, she's nervous about allowing her daughter to even go to the playground to play with friends. And she has uh, a husband who's a doctor. <laughs> and this doesn't sound like very wifely support, but she told him if he uh, should contract the virus, that he's out of the house. But she's hopeful that good things will eventually come. I guess even if her husband gets kicked out of the house. Edging out on a limb here, T is going to stand for truthful in our song that is being transposed. This is something to keep in mind when you're frustrated with somebody you think is not telling you the whole truth. Maybe not every individual or group can face or absorb the whole truth and nothing but the truth all the time, right at this moment. But most healthy Americans, nonetheless, recognize the importance of truth and ultimately see the value in working their way toward swallowing the truth hook, line, and sinker. This is part of the brilliance of the research and uh, findings of Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross in her work on the stages of grief, which is now dated work, and yet it's still talked about all the time. Uh, as many people face death or the death of a loved one, uh, or yeah, I mean, not everybody can 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 let that hit them full force. As I record this, uh, it's the evening of July 3rd, and tomorrow, July 4th, will be the second anniversary of my mother's death. And many of you have experienced deaths in your families, and I've experienced being your pastor during those times. I know way more than I ever intended to know about how it feels to lose loved ones. But I certainly could not accept the full implications of what it meant to have lost my mother, my second parent, all at once. It takes time and it happens in stages. They're not neat and predictable and they don't happen the same way for everybody but it takes time before it all sort of hits embracing the truth and all its facets may be a journey and for most people it is a journey and today as the apostle paul said today i may see only in part that may be the best i can do the very best i can do today is to accept one facet of truth but one of these days, one of these days, I will know as fully and completely the truth. In the same way that God knows and embraces all there is to me, all the good and all the bad. It's more important that we insist on and preserve the truth communally than individually. 
the individually we can kind of work along at our own pace. Communally, we need to insist on truth. Um, if we have to, if we have to work at different paces in two realms, and I think that we probably do, then then yes, yeah, so be it. A couple of quotes here from Stuart Stafford um, related to truth in politics. The first uh, first uh, statement: honesty is the rarest commodity in the 21st century. Wow. No one looks to the political class or journalists for truth these days. The average Joe seems to spend most of their time peddling a ludicrous, flawless <laughs> Facebook version of their lives. The peer pressure of political correctness foregoes truth for the sake of groupthink. Seems that comedians and writers represent the last bastion of candor out there today. And the second comment from Stafford. You can tell a politician is lying when they claim they want fairness for all. They're part of and represent an unfair elite who will never share their wealth, power, or opportunities with the underclass. Ponder that. Americans, for the most part, are independent, individually, group, or at least we like to think that we are. That is our goal, independence. We're not nearly as independent as we pretend. I clipped this. It's the clock of the U.S. of our, of our national debt. July third, twenty twenty. Look at the percentages at the bottom of that screen, the bottom of that graph. You can find this online. It moves constantly. I that's just a a still that I managed to catch. And though there's a good bit of talk about how independent we are in terms of the energy that we use, the fact is we're not so much. Minority groups feel very little independence. People of color feel under attack by racist police people. I still contend that most police women and men are not racist, not out to try to randomly kill people, but there are some out there who are, and it's more than a few. Look at this, look at this chart at the top. Groups most likely to be killed by law enforcement. Oh my God, there's, there's enough statistics to put this together. For all people of color, Patriotic Americans are spiritual people. Now, make sure we're on the same page. Spirituality and religion are not the same things. Not at all. They may support or enhance each other, or they may be completely unrelated. They may be at, at odds with each other. They may have nothing to do with each other. But... Patriotic Americans, at some level, understand the importance of healthy spirituality. 
separation of church and state, or as I like to say, synagogue, church, mosque, and state, which represents the monotheists among us. It's not as inclusive as it should be because there are plenty of Americans who are not monotheists, plenty who have religious connections who are not monotheists. But separation of synagogue, church, mosque, and state, that absolutely has to be. But separation of spirituality and patriotism or separation of spirituality and politics, no, no. There's no reason that those have to be separated at all. The church is having less and less influence on spirituality. Um, I've got several charts here. I'm not going to take much time with them. I might do a podcast about, about them. You can stop the video and uh, read them for yourselves. Uh, this is by the Barna Group, and these are dated. Uh, I think this is 2016, 2017. I don't know if this is the last time they evaluated these or if they now have um, newer ones that are for sale. I couldn't quite figure that out. But uh, this chart uh, has the, the 20 most churched cities. M more people go to church in these cities than any of the other cities in the United States, and you can notice very quickly none are anywhere close to us. Same time frame, the 20 most unchurched cities. Um, let's see. Is there an unchurched city close to us? Yes, Philadelphia is 19 out of 20 in the top 20 unchurched cities. So our neighbor, probably same thing, spills right on over to us. Now, the Barna people came up with this term, de-churched. <laughs> it's like being declawed or something, uh, but, but, but it's, it's, it's a voluntary, I think, mostly voluntary. I don't think it has to do with people who are tossed out of the church. Uh, these uh, people once were active in church, at least to some degree, maybe very active in church. And then they decided to separate themselves from all churches, not go find another church, but to separate themselves from all churches. And these are spread out uh, more all over the country than the most... Um, churched or unchurched, de-churched people. Again, our neighbor city, Philadelphia, is right there at 16. It's pretty consistent with unchurched and de-churched. San Francisco, at least in 2016 or 17, had the most people who had um, once gone to church and now, do, now don't. What has driven these people away from church? The church is no longer providing a spiritual haven for them. Uh, is it that the church is not capable of doing that anymore? Or, or have churches become irrelevant uh, in their approach? Yes. Uh, yeah, I'll make that a a non-rhetorical question we have. I was talking to Joe Deutsch the other day, so happy that Joe has a new job that's going to let him be in church with us more whenever we get to come back to church. And it looks like uh, I will get to see you next uh, next week, as it turns out. Um, and uh, Joe said that one of the things that we should have learned from this is that we can do more online, and indeed we can. Um, and uh, he and I, and also our deacon chair, Priscilla Wilson, I've been talking for some time about the importance of small groups and not discounting them, not acting like the only uh, thing to come to church for is Sunday morning. And if you can't do that, you're just pretty much... Uh, cast away.
more information from the Barna Group. I believe this is now up to two, um, yeah, two, 2018. But I want you to notice as I speak about the Barna Group at this slide and the next, that their definition of Christianity is like see ourselves and identify ourselves as followers of Jesus who don't buy into much of the theological uh, framework that they use to define uh, what is Christian as opposed to this important term now that we've been hearing for a few years, post-Christian. And this does fit into the S, spirituality, part of being a patriot. Um, it may come as no surprise, they wrote, that the influence of Christianity in the United States is waning. Rates of church attendance, religious affiliation, belief in God, prayer, Bible reading have all been dropping for decades. By consequence, the role of religion in public life has been slowly diminishing and the church no longer functions with the cultural authority it held in times past. These are unique days for the church in America as it learns what it means to flourish, to flourish in a new post-Christian era. Go to the website and read what's been on our website, Silverside Dr. Day, for a long time, for months. We can still contribute to people's spirituality though they may not buy into what we have defined as church and church participation for a long time. Guess who's going to have to change? You can take the time to read this if you like <laughs> their metrics for uh, what it means to be post-Christian. Um, yeah, I'm not going to spend any time on it, but it's important, I think, if you want to pursue this, um, to take time to read what they say. This is what I this is what I was referring to a moment ago when I said I think there are plenty of Silverside people who consider themselves followers of Jesus who don't buy into many of these. Quick look at the top ten most post Christian cities in America. Post Christian. Um, doesn't mean that there aren't a lot of spiritually focused people trying to um, find a way to have a healthy spiritual life without being connected to a traditional church. Closest city to us, let me see here, is New York City. Many of these are in the Northeast. This is Barna's latest post-Christian city. 100, 100 of them, you have to get out your magnifying glass, uh, or we can always send you a copy from the office. We'll be happy to do that. Closest one to us? Philly. And finally, the last letter of patriotism, and the last part of our song, is built around the M, which is magnanimous. You know, at this point, I'm, so, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, what if I left out a letter? I'm applauding for the United States for being the number one most generous uh, uh, country in the world for the last 10 years. It also stirred up both my dogs, who are now uh, sitting right here beside my computer, uh, wanting to, uh, to go out and play. The U.S., 10 years, the number one most generous country in the world. And yet we're kind of ambivalent about people who are poor because a lot of people who have money to spare think that people who are poor brought it on themselves. Therefore, they're not generous with individuals who are poor. They might give money to a big cause or something to that effect, uh, or to uh, an individual who can be um, uh, sort of judicious about who gets the money. But there is an ambivalence about people who are poor. And 
most Americans, most Americans believe that people are poor because they've just made poor choices. That's, that's, that embarrasses me, that 42% of the population think that most of the poor people out there are poor because they made poor life choices. Most of the people who are poor out there were born into poverty and didn't know how to get out. And drugs and alcohol being number two, well, yeah, there are plenty of people who are poor because they've spent their money on drugs and alcohol, but some of that 40% have not embraced the reality that addiction, and not every person who spends money on drugs and alcohol is an addict, but those who are addicts have an illness. But that aside, when we have money available, Americans tend to be magnanimous with other Americans and with people around the world. 